congratulations and thank you for sharing a bit about your yeah. adventures. Plan yes, <laughs> yes, great. Well, Plan B is always, you know, in some ways, you know, I think we all have experienced that, uh, uh, the most fascinating part of our lives, right? You know, it's what you do with Plan B. You know, Plan A is boring in my opinion, you know, when things go according to how you plan. I think it's fun when you end up with Plan B and you do something amazing with it. That's what the new school spirit is, and I think you all have, I'm sure, encountered many of those moments and some of it you've talked about. So thank you really for sharing that. And really, uh, I think uh, uh, we have a few minutes. Uh, I hope, you know, uh, you know, you got some idea of what, you know, a small, you know, opportunity like what we offer uh, uh, can do uh, to you or to your friends uh, who uh, used it. And I would really encourage you to uh, apply, to uh, you know, kind of you know, explore, uh, and to run with it. Uh, for us, uh, it's important uh, to both see things through your eyes, uh, but also to uh, have your involvement. So for us, that's crucial, you know, to be part of a university-wide uh, initiative. So thank you all, and thank you for coming. But let, let me take about 10 minutes. Any, any questions or comments, you know, we can ask about it. Okay, it's for the ones that didn't speak the language. How do you manage? You just talk, um, like, you just kind of, I feel like you just kind of like understand. For example, like for me, like my research was about sporting goods. Like I wanted to see how the sporting goods market worked in China. Mm -hmm. But I knew that to do that, I had to rely on talking to people. So I went to classes of like dancing classes for like sports and played basketball with them and understood what was the sport culture like before even doing interviews with the big guys. And I think that if you just trust that you understand them I and if you actually put the effort of like not thinking that like they are not gonna talk to you if you don't speak their language, it's gonna come naturally. Like I'm from Italy, you know, like I, I, I knew a little Chinese, but I think that if, if, if you're here sitting and you think that you wanna go there, you already have the right mindset that no matter what the language barrier is, you'll be able to understand each other. Yeah. I think, okay. now. Well, I had a different, I don't know if I need this. Um, I had a different experience. Yes, of course, I communicated with people um, through body language and you know, talking, and I knew pe people speak English and in Asia, um, but for the interviews that I did, I worked with a translator um, because it's really the only way to get, and I worked with good translators, it's the only way to get accurate information. So if you really want to talk to people and you're interested in what people have to say to you um, and the information that they have, and you're not, you just don't want to guess and make assumptions off of your observations, it's important that you work with someone who speaks the language. So. Yeah, hire a translator or find a friend who knows the language. Yeah, and I think the grant, you know, you know, in some ways, you have to figure out, you know, how you you want you want to use part of the money for your overall experience. And if the purpose of your being there, you know, requires you to get more closer, you know, understanding of what you want to know, then investing in a translator. Is very important. Okay, thank you. Any other comments? You want to say something? Sorry. I uh, I I wanted to share a funny story. Oh, sorry. It, because it's not even about the, a translation. In my case, because I wanted to do archival research, and the years are counted in a different way. Um, prior to 1912, prior to the Chinese Revolution. So I go to the archives and they say, okay, this is uh, the 10th year of the reign of Emperor Qianlong. So try to calculate it to see what year that is in, in Western years. It's like, I, I, I don't know how to calculate the years that uh, an emperor has ruled. I don't even know when he started. So I have to go back to where the emperor started ruling in Western years and calculate 10 years into that to know what year we're talking about. It was challenging. <laughs> so yes, you do need translators sometimes. Do you give grants to like, uh, the middle regions, like the taller uh, for this um, 
Uh, unfortunately, not. But I think you know uh, people have used the uh, you know opportunity to spend time you know as Michaela did part of her time in Cambodia. But we want most of our grants to be used for either spending time in India or China. But if you are in India, Bhutan is not that far, so you can go there or Nepal or pass through Nepal. Yeah. Uh, my question is actually for you. You mentioned that a lot of people get saying that the round Sadly, I couldn't find anybody to answer that question. <laughs> okay. There is also a big disconnect in, in or maybe I sh it's not fair to say that it's disconnect, because when students nowadays in China, when they study their history, there's so much information that they probably cannot, even if they wanted to, they cannot learn everything. So when I go around and ask people who are in their 20s and 30s, hey, why Shanghai uh, 2,000 years ago had round walls? They're looking at me, are you crazy? Who cares? <laughs> 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 but come on, it says that that's the reason why Shanghai is so prominent. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Hopefully, you know, next time when we meet, you know, you'll find that answer yeah. from some of the so-called China scholars, right? Yeah, the Mongols. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's the Mongols. We can blame it everything on Mongols. Yeah, of course. <laughs> then I would definitely suggest if you decide to go to China, to go to both a traditional city like Beijing and then to a modern city like Shanghai, because, like Mar Marina was saying, they're really different, and the pictures you get from and the stories you hear from both cities and the way they portray China and the West are different in Shanghai than they are in Beijing or other mm -hmm. traditional cities. Did you guys have any challenges allocating the grant money? It, they're far away land, so I think a big chunk of it goes for the airfare. Um, <laughs> did you have to manage from your own finance, finance as well to fund your trips? Find all your friends who have friends on Facebook who live in India and China instead. <laughs> I guess the, the it's a um, you have well the allocation for the for the for the fare for the airfare, and then well the second most important part is defining where you're gonna where you're gonna stay. Obviously, if you haven't been there, uh, I was very fortunate to find a place very close to the organization, so it was only a two minute walk. I mean, it was actually really only a block away. And right next to me, all was, there was also the train station. So I guess also do the research very specifically and having probably two or three options where you're going to stay. And depending on that, then you can allocate like the rest of the of the things that you're going to use. Obviously, uh, um, you know your budget uh, in terms of food and, and transportation, you can use it very. I mean, it's like enough basically. Uh, well, depending on the days, I guess. But but it's Hong Kong is more expensive than New York. And Shanghai is yes. getting there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think really a lot depends on how long you plan to stay there, your lifestyle. Some people, you know, uh, uh, spend money, you know, for things that require, you know, more resources. So therefore, you have to mobilize your own resources. But if you really want to live like a student researcher, then I think uh, our experience is that most of them do somehow manage, you know. But people should expect to put in more resources if you're traveling or if your project requires you to be in Hong Kong or Shanghai, major cities, they, they do cost. You know, the cost of living is much higher there. Yes, please. For your research, did you initiate the project yourself or did you have like an institution in China or India that you work with? I mean, um, I guess if you will work with like nonprofits, things like that. Yeah, well, yeah. I would say we can go down the line. Yeah, yeah. Oh, um, well, for me, I mean, it's a new thing that in order to go to the archives, you need to have affiliation with academic institution in, in China. And I could have gotten that, but also my time was too limited. Uh, and now they have other restrictions on archives. But yes, having an institutional affiliation or having someone who is within the institution becomes extremely important if you're looking at archival work. Um, otherwise, I, I don't know because 
Yeah, I was gonna say that um, at the like at the beginning of the uh, like writing the proposal, I already knew what the topic was going to be about. So after that, I tried to research and also have at least two or three options of, of the places. Um, and then, well, after this defining, like there was uh, one music organization in Mumbai and the other one in Delhi. And then also like talking to to well the institute itself, they, they were recommending it. it's only better like to focus in one place and to like base yourself there. Uh, I think that was like a great option, and also the, well with music we are still working. I'm like developing their website, like renovating their website, uh, working on the video profiles for the people, for the participants, the, their parents. So it, it was a very good like choice. I don't know how was how would have been with the other uh, with the Delhi institution. But, uh, but yeah, I guess the most important part is like once you know that you're going to actually do that project, then get, you know, keep constant uh, contact with, with the organization. I had Skype meetings, uh, like, you know, getting more of the head at time. Yeah. I think it depends on the kind of project that you want to have ultimately. Um, I chose not to affiliate with my, myself with any institution um, in either uh, Hong Kong, Shenzhen, or Phnom Penh. Um, because I was researching in the garment industry, it's a really touchy issue, um, like labor rights, and uh, I didn't want it to, didn't want my project to get overrun by someone else's agenda. So if you have a really strong idea of what you want to do, um, you know, that, that, and you can't find an organization that does exactly that. Um, I think it's smart to stay independent, and it takes a lot of extra effort, I think, though, because you have to make all your own contacts and um, like find the people, you know, find everyone to talk to, and even find friends to hang out with. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it just ultimately depends on the kind of project you want to run. Um, I did not have any connections initially, and spent the whole first part of the grant, um, just reaching out to a lot of different NGOs all around India and uh, was getting very few responses as well and then finally came upon uh, Nazdeek after what felt like forever, um, which ended up working out great. But yeah, I started with no connections and that was actually a big struggle for me. Initially, I thought it would be very easy to reach out to people and say, hey, I'll come work with you for free. And, but very few responses, um, so I think finding a strong partner is helpful. Yeah, I also think it depends on the project, but uh, you, I think you do need to have someone strong that will connect you to the people so you can actually access to the people that has the information, otherwise they are not gonna talk to you. I, I think uh, two things that you should also understand. Uh, one is we call this deliberately exploratory grants, travel grants. And I, I think when you think about, you know, affiliations or approvals, there, there are two levels. One is what uh, Marina is indicating, right? If you are thinking about government approval or official, official approval, those things require a lot of time and a lot of planning beforehand. You know, if you are doing serious, you know, doctoral research, ethnographic research, then you know, most departments and universities would prepare you and there's a whole step you go through that and that takes a while, okay? But I think these are really travel grants. So in most of our cases, people really don't have, the, you really, it's realistically not you know, uh, possible to get official permission. So, so it doesn't surprise. Because in fact, you travel as a tourist, you know, because to get an official student visa, research visa, b both in India and China is a lot more cumbersome and, uh, in a very, very you know, complicated process. Uh, however, I think you know, when it comes to uh, the importance of affiliation, I think I agree that it depends on the project, but affiliation at two levels. One is who is going to be your institutional partner, you know, whether it's a civil society organization or a university-based department or you know, even a private sector you know, entity. Uh, having someone, uh, an, an, an office of some uh, type, uh, I think uh, becomes your so-called home base, and then from there you can you know, build additional context, I think uh, is uh, something that we uh, strongly advise uh, anyone going to India and China. And then on top of that, the importance of you know, networking individual you know, uh, uh, 
individuals in these countries, either through your new school uh, uh, networks or EC networks, I think are very, very uh, crucial in making sure that you end up having a very you know, robust and uh, productive uh, experience. Any last minute comment? Okay, well, okay, last well, question. Well, it's really simple. Did you guys feel lonely in any of that time you were there? Because I know, I mean, you travel for, a, you have an objective. You know what you want to do, but sometimes you need people around you. Um, the very first day I got there, I, I was feeling lonely. And then I, I talked to my sister, and I never felt lonely in my life. <laughs> and I was like, I never felt like this. Like, what do I do? Like, what do I, 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 I only had my computer. I, I didn't have Wi Fi. I was like, what do I do? And like, and she was like, Karina, just you tell me, just go outside. So I just literally went outside of my room, met a couple of people, went out with these strangers, and I started my adventure. <laughs> like, you just kind of have to just throw yourself out there. It'll come naturally. I think. I don't know about that. Yeah. I, mean, I was fortunate. The group I was working with was really friendly and ended up introducing me to a lot of people kind of in our age group, although I was younger than a lot of them, but uh, that was fun. The one thing that was kind of a bummer was I was there, the last week and I was there was Independence uh, Day, and I thought that would be a big, like, kind of celebration, fun way to end my trip, but a lot of the people that I had met in the month prior we're on vacation because you got a day off, um, so they ended up leaving before I was leaving, so the last weekend was kind of sad and I was by myself, but other than that, it was very easy to meet people and have a really good time. Okay, well, uh, I think uh, it is true that, you know, when you go to uh, foreign, you know, places, uh, new places, uh, loneliness is something that, you know, does, you know, uh, come as part of the so-called, you know, experience, right? But, uh, but I think people have written about them, you know, how when you're doing, especially long field research, that how that can be very uh, challenging, but as time passes, those are the times, you know, when you look back and you say, you know, there were moments or there are ideas that emerge that shape, you know, what you do the rest of your life. So on that note, loneliness is not necessarily bad. <laughs> Actually, good. You meditate. Uh, I want to thank you all for really uh, coming uh, to uh, our conversation. We will continue to uh, find ways to really uh, host events. I know we were uh, in Thomas and I. We were talking about if he when when he finishes his uh, documentary, maybe uh, sometime towards the end of this semester or even you know early next semester, we'll try to have one evening pizza evening or something like that where the students can come together and really celebrate and share a bit more on you know how student engagement in some way shapes what we do at ICI. So stay tuned and, uh, and we hope to uh, see you around and uh, thank you again to all of you uh, and thanks to my ICI team, you know, many of them. Uh, can you raise your hands, all the ICI volunteers and students who work there, a bunch of them here. So really, often I don't get to and I forget, you know, uh, to thank them, you know, but they really uh, make you know the institute really uh, a fun place to be, you know, at, and, and I'm thankful to all of you. Thank you. Thank you.